All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to lecture one of this 2024-25 school year with Knowable World. My name is Mr. Powell, and I've been teaching a program called History at Our House, just like this one, <laughs> for 20 years now using the internet. And this year, the program, and from now on, the program will be called Knowable World. I think this is a great name. I'm really happy that we came up with it. Uh, you know, what does it mean, right? It means there's this great big world out there that we live in. And most people actually find it quite confusing and difficult to understand and troubling and all, all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, what we want to do is what we want to make that world known to you. We want you to know it. We want you to make sense of it. We want you to feel like this world is a place that you know, you understand, you can make sense of. And that is absolutely true. It, it, we live in a knowable world. Let's get to knowing it, shall we? <laughs> How are we going to do that? Well, the way that we're going to understand this, learn to understand this world that we live in is by studying history. Now, most people think that, that, that history is just learning about things that happened in the past, right? In a simple sort of way, people describe history as being the study of the past. That, as it turns out, is not a good way to know the world. People like me and your parents and everybody else out there that's stuck in public school is going to feel like, wait a minute, what does the studying the past have to do with making sense of the world that we live in? And the truth is, there's never been a good answer to that question. When I was your age in school and we studied history, I thought it was the most boring thing ever. And almost everybody did too. I didn't like history because we were learning about people that died a long time ago in some other place doing stuff we didn't understand. And okay, it doesn't matter how much of that you read, how much of that you memorize, it turns into a great big nothing. And that's annoying. I didn't like history, most people don't. And, and I feel, you know, I felt a long time ago, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? I, I, I didn't become a historian right away in my, in my adult life. I actually became an engineer. So I was studying engineering and I thought, you know, that I would do that. I thought I would do that because I didn't like things like history because I thought those things were useless. And at least if you learn something technical and you can get a job and, you know, you can do interesting work, that uh, you know, you're probably better off than wasting your time with things like history. But then, as a young adult studying engineering, I started to realize that I didn't un understand the world that I was living in, and I didn't like that feeling. I said to myself, "Okay, it's, it's I can maybe I can build a road or maybe I can build a bridge." But wait a minute, is that is that really all there is? You know, just making money and and. and Okay, those can be good things. I got nothing against that. I love, I love buildings. I love everything that engineers do. It's all great, uh, but it's not good enough. We need, we need the kind of knowledge that helps us to live our lives that in, in a way that we can end up being successful and happy people. And science and engineering, great stuff, but it's not enough. We need more. When you look around at the world and you see how very unhappy a lot of people are, how they're yelling at each other on all of the apps on the internet and how angry they are about so many things and how there are wars in the world and so many. Wow, you realize something is not right there. Why are things like that? And okay, what should I think about those things? How do I understand them? And how do I help myself to live a good life and be a happy person if I'm surrounded by those kinds of things? Those are tough, tough questions right there. 
Uh, and so when I was an engineer, those are the kinds of questions I didn't have good answers to because nobody had taught me history properly. And so I started to study it myself. And then I went and got a history degree, which didn't help because when you study history in college, all they do is pile on more books and make, make, make you memorize more useless stuff about the past. I didn't like it, but I was very lucky because I got a job teaching history to kids exactly your age. I started to try to tell the story of the things that were happening in the past uh, in an interesting way. And usually I did a pretty good job and I was, I was okay with that. But I saw that students that learned history, even a better version of it, were not really getting any advantages from it. They were not really learning about the world. And that just made me think more and more and more about, okay, how do we fix this problem? How do we make history not just a bunch of interesting stories and some puzzles that we like to solve, but how do we make it into something that really does actually help us to understand the world. And so that's, I've been now working on, on that problem for, for at least the last 15 years and stuff like that. And so what we do in knowable world is we don't study the past. That's not the version of history you're going to get. What we do is this, this is what I think history is, what history should be. History to me, history in knowable world is, the revelation and explanation of the world we live in. It's pretty important words in there. What do you suppose it means that you're going to get a revelation? What's that word mean? What are you expecting when I tell you that that's what you're going to get? What's a revelation? Well, it comes, you know, the verb is to reveal something. So when somebody reveals something to you, what are they doing? What's a synonym for reveal? Abby, go ahead. What's, what does it mean to reveal something? Somebody is revealing a surprise to somebody. That's a good example of revealing, but then we need, a, that's a good example, but we need another word to describe, you know, that word reveal, right? So what would be that synonym or, because you have a surprise, a surprise, right? Okay, so, okay. What is, what's revealed there? Man, what, do, what does it mean to reveal something? To like show it to somebody? Okay, there's a good starting synonym, right? Synonym means a word that has a very similar meaning to another word, right? So to show it, right? I, I want to show you the world. Here it is. There's the world we live in. If you look at it from space, it's not going to look like this, of course, right? Because those lines and those colors don't exist on the planet. But those lines actually do exist in the way that we organize human life in this world. And that's a weird thing. Like, what's up with this weird arrangement? What are all of these things? One of the things that is to be revealed about the world is that human life is organized into what? What are all these colored chunks on the map? Not a too hard of a question, right? Where do we start when we're trying to understand the world, Owen? Their countries. Countries, right? Life, human life is organized into this arrangement that we call countries. Okay, right? So that's a start, right? So what is that all about? And okay, what do we do with that, right? And the revelation of the world is to help you see what there is to see. There's a lot out there and you can't see it just living in your own house and driving around the city that you live in. That's not the world, right? So you do have ways of knowing about that wider world, but it's not obvious from the way you walk and talk every day, right? So in other words, you live in this world, whether you know it or not, and a lot of it needs to be revealed to you. And it's pretty exciting to learn about that, to realize, oh, I live in this great big place. 
I live in one of these countries and it's, you know, it's one of many and what are people like? And I've met people from other countries. And I know that my family used to be in one country and now we live in another country and things of that sort. Uh, and so that's part of this kind of, we start to open up our minds and realize, oh yeah, everything that's in our bedroom, all the toys that we have and stuff like that, that's fun, nothing wrong with it, right? But when we get out of our house and we go out into the bigger world, and then we hear adults talking and they're th saying things about other things and we're trying to understand and we're talking to family on the internet and all these things, we're buying foods at the grocery store and toys and so on. And you see, and you turn them over and on, on the toy, it says made in China, right? And it's like, oh, okay, or something else, right? Your, your t-shirt, right, is, is made in Bangladesh. Or, okay, what's, wait a minute. So in other words, I live in a way that's connected to all these different places in the world and uh, that's an interesting puzzle. Like, how come we do this? And, and what are other people like in other places? And if you travel with your family and go to other countries, you'll see oh, some of them are a lot alike. Some of them are very different. People speak different languages. They have different traditions. They live different. It's really interesting to see that. And then, then the questions come, right? And it's like, wait a minute, why is this country like this? Why is that country like that? and so on, right? How can you possibly answer questions like that? There's only one subject that does it. There is only one subject that does it. That's history. If you want the world explained, if you wanna know why are things the way they are, the only answer to that is things happened to make the world this way. People did things that made the world into what it is. When did they do those things? They did them in the past, okay? Because here we are right now in the present, literally everything, including the last 10 minutes, that's the past. Everything that brought us to this moment is the past. And we wouldn't be here in this moment if it weren't for all of that stuff. So history is, first of all, the revelation of the world that we live in. And then the questions come and history provides the answers, okay? so. That's what we are trying to do here. Now, Van, if you still got something, go ahead and say it. Otherwise, don't forget to put down your hand. Okay, so we live in a world of countries, right? Nearly 200 of them. So that is a really big number. Very difficult to manage. Most people have no need to know those 200 countries. I study history and I don't need to know them all, but... I'm looking at maps all the time. So usually I can probably tell you the names of maybe 150 of them, uh, but you know, I'm not too worried about not knowing all of them. Nobody needs to be worried about that. But there's this great big world with all these countries in it. We do need to have an organized understanding of it. We do need to be comfortable when we look at this. We know where we are. We know what we're looking at, right? So, and we're, we're starting with countries. So one of the best ways I can think of to get this really messy picture organized in our mind is to start by at least knowing where the biggest countries are. I call them the big six, right? And so let's quickly rifle off those ones. For most of you, this is easy review, right? So let's do them as quick as we can, right? So let's start with, in this world that we live in, the biggest of all the countries, look at the size of that chunk on the map there, is this reddish one over here, right? Which one is that? The largest country in the world. Dan, go ahead. It's Russia. Russia, okay. Now, the other ones are all about the same size. So it doesn't matter too much what order we do them in. But let's go over here to this neighbor of Russia. This big yellow country over here. Which one is that? Abby, you're up. Uh, Asia. Well, this is all Asia, right? So people use the word Asia. It's not always that useful of a term. Asia is a hard thing to understand what it is. So yes, Asia is all of this stuff, okay? But we're looking for a country only. So. Uh, Owen, go ahead. Help us with that. It's China. One is China, the biggest country in Asia. 
Okay, let's go over here to where we are. <laughs> All right, let's start in blue. That one should be the easiest for everybody. <laughs> okay, James, go ahead. America. United States of America or America for short, of course. And then Adeline, help me with this one above. Canada. That one's Canada. Okay, so now we got the biggest four. And let's go with the big five and the big six. Next, in terms of size, is this country down here. This one is in an area called South America or a continent called South America, right? And so which one is this, Abby? South America. Well, no, this is the continent. I mean, we want countries. We want Brazil. countries. Brazil. Good for you. Brazil, and then finally this one over here, which is kind of like a country and a continent at the same time. Van, go ahead. Australia. Australia. Okay, good. The big six, folks, right? When you are looking at world geography, the big six really pop because of their sheer size, right? And then if you don't know where another country is, then, you know, you find these ones and you can think to yourself, okay, and you can describe it to yourself. If you want to know where another country is, then it can be really useful to just say, okay, so uh, uh, where is, Mr. Powell, where is Mexico? So if I had to describe it to you, what I would say to you is Mexico is a country that's, you know, a medium-sized country directly south of the United States. Okay, what color is it on this map? Which color is Mexico on this map? I just told you where it is, right? Adeline? Yellow. It's yellow, right? And if I told you that India is, uh, again, a large, medium country that is uh, south of China, a large, medium-sized country that is south of China, okay? What color is it on the map? Dan, go ahead. It is orange. Yeah, exactly, right? So that's I described it to you, and you could tell me which one it is, right? So it's pretty easy, if you know where the big ones are, to start finding other ones in a lot of different ones, right? So we got the big six. And today, we're talking about countries, because we want to know, okay, we want to know what are the big ones, and what are the most important ones? That's a really important word. I've often joked in history classes, important is the most important word in history. It's not just about learning true things. There are way too many things that are true to learn. Can't possibly learn them all. We don't want to waste our time. We want to learn important things. Okay, how do we learn if countries are important or not? How do we figure that out? Well, we just started with one idea, right? One idea is that if they're really big, that might be a clue. Is it necessarily, right, you know, going to tell us if it's the very important or not? Okay, Russia, Canada, China, the United States, Brazil, Australia, the top six, right? We just mentioned India as well, and so on, right? These are the biggest countries in the world. Does that necessarily mean they're the most important? No, it can be a clue. I mean, what did you want to say? Um, because their history is important. Well, yeah, that's a definitely going to be an explanation of why they are important. But we also can look at other clues about the way things are right now. So before we do the explanation part, we have to do the revelation part. That's what I'm doing. So, revealing to you guys, for instance, which of these countries in the world have the most number of people in them? That is an interesting clue. Which country in the world has the most people in it? Adeline, go ahead. China. That's an interesting and good guess, but actually no longer true. This was the chart of the world's population that I gave a couple years ago when the answer absolutely was China. But then notice, one year later, check this out, 
Look at the numbers. What happened to the population of India and what happened to the population of China? Owen, go ahead. Unmute yourself properly there. You might have a headset muted. You don't want to mute your headset, only your Zoom. Okay, when you get that sorted out, try again. Abby, or Van, go ahead. Did they all go to America? No. <laughs> no, no, but look, all I'm asking is, here's 1,411,000,000. Here's 1,409,000,000. What happened to the number? Not hard, Adeline? It went down. It went down. What happened to the population of India? 1,392,000,000. Oh, it went up by a lot. This one went down. And this is an old number. What's happening to the population of China? Down. What's happening to the population of India? Up. They have now switched places. India has more people than China. So, you know, this is basically what happened here. The population of India has been going up over time. This is the year 1800, 1850. We're over here, right? In 2024. Right here, they got this wrong in the, in the chart, but because it's happening faster than they thought, India went past China, and China has been going downhill. It's going downhill fast now. That right there is one of the more interesting things in the world, is that there are countries that are shrinking is that normal? No, it's not normal. Look at this. All this time for hundreds of years, up, 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 hundreds of years, up, 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 going up and up faster and faster. Wow. What, ha what does that mean that a population would shrink? Abby, question or comment? Go ahead. Um, how does it... Uh, how does it shrink? That's, a, that's exactly the right question. Good. So how do we get more people in the world? Let's start with that. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Okay. <laughs> Abby, go ahead again. <laughs> Mommies and daddies have babies. <laughs> Mommies and daddies have babies. Okay. How do we get fewer people in the world? It's sad, right? But it happens to every single person. Then <laughs> they die. People die. Okay, so the way that we get more people is that every year there's more babies than there are people that die. So the number of people that are alive goes up. So how do we get fewer people? Well, in the simplest explanation, it means that more people are dying than are being born. People are not having a lot of babies and people are, who are older are dying. That's the simplest explanation. Part of what me, me, the, the reason why I have to say simple is because the explanation is actually a little bit more complicated than that. Because among the countries of the world, people move as well. So you can be born in one country, but then decide to leave and go somewhere else. And so that happens a lot in the world. People move. Uh, and so that's another part of the explanation. For China, the reason why the population is going down is because they're having fewer babies. People are dying and they're not having babies. That has already happened to another important country in the world. Japan already, since for about more than 10 years now, they've been having fewer babies and more people are dying. The population of Japan is also shrinking. This year that we are studying, right, is entitled Asia, Africa, and the world we live in. I just mentioned China and Japan. Those are two countries in Asia. That's interesting. Two countries where the population is shrinking. Not, you know, most countries still populations are growing, but there are quite a few countries, more and more of them, where the population is shrinking. People are not having a lot of babies for a lot of different reasons. History is involved in that as well. Other explanations are a part of it. So what makes a country important 
is not so much how many people it has. That's a part of it. It's what those people do that matters, that makes a country important. Because of course, if you got a lot of people and they're all sitting around playing video games, that's not gonna be an important country. But if you got a lot of people and they're working really hard, making lots of stuff that people, other people want to buy, ah, making the world a better place, ah, then we're going to get something important. And that's what we call an economy. One of the vocabulary words of this, economy is not a simple thing to explain, but we can give a simple version of the explanation for starters. And that would be an economy is all the things that people make and trade with one another. When a country has a big economy, what it tells us is the people there are making and trading a lot of things. Because why do we need both? Why do we need both? Why is it not enough to say trading? And why is it not enough to say making? Neither of those is enough by itself to have an economy. So Van, go ahead. Question, can you have an economy with like a low amount of, of or like a low population? Yes, if the people, everybody, there's always an economy. It depends what the size is. Right. So you'll have one, but depends on how much people make and trade. So let's start with make. Why would it not? Well, actually, let's start with trade. <laughs> so why would it not be enough to have an economy uh, to say it's all the things that people trade? Why is that not enough? Abby? Because no one makes money if they trade. Well, okay, <laughs> that's a tricky answer, but there's a little bit more to it. Why is the word trade not enough? Where does the stuff come from that people trade? It first has to be <laughs> okay, Abby. Bought or farmed or made. Okay, made is the word. Farmed would be an example of made, right? People must produce or make the things that are traded. We don't trade air. We all need it. We all breathe, but nobody needs to produce it. it we don't have to pay for it because nobody makes it. We have to pay for water. Well, water is everywhere. How can we have to pay for it? There's always an ocean nearby or a river or a lake. Why do we have to pay for water? Adeline? Because we need it filtered. Because somebody has to make it clean, make it. Somebody has to produce clean water and send it to us in pipes so that it come out of the sink. Right? So you have to make things and then trade them and you have an economy. Look how that's organized in the world. The United States makes trades way more things than anybody else. China is a pretty impressive second, right? Yeah. There's these numbers just basically, we're not going to try to explain exactly what it means, but it's just the size of the numbers that tells us how big is the economy. So obviously this 19 is a really big number. 12 is a big number. Compared to these, wow, you go down third on the list. Japan only makes four compared to China's 12. Germany only makes three compared to America's 19. You go down the list, UK, India, and so on. They're all around two. Canada, Italy, one. Okay, so in other words, but these are still the top 10. So that means there's 190 countries that are lower than this. Less important because the people there don't make as many things. Don't make and trade as many things. So this would be a way to help us to get organized. What people make and trade helps us to understand who's important in the world. Lazy people are not important. <laughs> Productive people are important. People that make interesting, important things, right? 
usually end up being the people with a lot of money, like Elon Musk. He makes programs, rocket ships, electric vehicles. He makes things. People pay him. He's super rich. Jeff Bezos made Amazon. People shop there. Super rich. People that make lots of things are more important than people that don't. Abby, go ahead. Um, why isn't Mexico on the list? Because it's lower than number 10. Mexico's in the top 20, but it does not make the top 10. It's getting there though. Mexico's doing pretty well. They're, they're making progress, but they are lower than number 10. So it didn't, didn't, have, didn't have enough room for them to be on here. Okay? Now, so we got the size of a country, geography. We have the size of how many people there are in a country. We have how much stuff those people are making and trading. These are different ways of organizing the way we think about countries. What other things go along with those to decide who's important? Which countries are important? Which ones do we need to pay a, a lot of attention to? What are the other ways in which we are going to measure countries and say, this one's important and this one's not so much important? How do we decide? What other things? Abby, what do you think? Um, how much they make and produce for others. Well, that's included in this number. So it's definitely a part of this, but that's included here. Okay. So now we got to think of something completely different. What would it be? What are some other variables in terms of who's important? We're going to talk a lot about this year that the United States is the world's police power. What does that involve? What kind of importance? How do you police the world? Owen, go ahead. By having a strong military. Military power is a big deal. Exactly. So country in terms of military power, the United States way up at the top of the list. Other countries that have really powerful militaries, Russia, which has invaded its neighbor Ukraine, China, Japan, India, France, and so on down the list. As you can see, this list is not the same as the other lists. Russia here is way higher than it is on this other list of population way down here. Oh, economy? Oh, actually, is Russia on this list? Do the Russians make and trade a lot of things that people want? No, Russia's not on this list. Oh, but, and yet, Russia is a big bully. <laughs> so there it is, high on the list. The United States is at the top of both lists. Aha, China's way at the top of the both lists. Japan's way high on both lists. Okay, so now we're kind of got to combine these things together. So we can do that. And we can say, okay, we got just sheer size. We got population. We got wealth or the economy. We have military power. And we're starting to see a lot of countries are showing up on both these lists. And that's going to allow us to organize our thinking about history. If you're not making these lists, you're probably not one of the most important countries in the world. If you're on more than one of these lists, you're probably in the, you know, in the conversation. Clearly, the most important country in the world is, well, okay, I shouldn't say clearly because it's really high on not not the you know biggest and so on, but in terms of wealth and power, it's a runaway leader, Abby. The USA. USA, yes. Number one. <laughs> All right. So yeah, absolutely. So we're going to talk about what that means. Other really important countries in Asia, China and Japan. Absolutely. India is also in Asia. Wow. So three. Asian countries are very high on all these lists. Interesting. Are there any African countries high on these lists? 
We're studying Asia, Africa, and the world we live in this year. Any African countries on these lists? Owen? Yeah, there's like, I think two, I, I think. Good for you. Algeria is an African country and uh, Nigeria is an African country. Okay, but they're not on these lists over here. So yeah, we'll talk more about that. All right, so we're getting started here. So we've got this great big world with the big six geographically. We also know that some of them are more important than others in different ways. So we're gonna figure out how to use that information to organize our map and we're gonna transform it into this, which is way more useful. Ta-da! Many of you know this well. So for you guys, this is all review and it's gonna start being automatic. I can shake you awake in the middle of the night and you'll be able to say all these things really easily. It'll be totally programmed in there. And you're gonna to start to understand things in a way that <laughs> adults can't even come close. You're gonna be the smartest person in the room when you're surrounded by adults. All right, it won't take long, <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> all right, so anyway, look where it happened to the time. So there we go, the end of lesson one, we're starting to get acquainted with the world we live in. Pick things up exactly here tomorrow and keep it rolling. Thank you for being here, folks. Welcome back to a year of knowable world. It's wonderful to be here. See you tomorrow. Bye, thank you for coming. Bye. Bye. Bye.